Welcome to the She's Got Gumption podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Olson. If you are somebody that loves a good story, you've come to the right place. I encourage women to be who God created them to be unapologetically. And I believe when we're vulnerable and we share our truths with one another, we can find freedom and healing right where it belongs. This podcast is for you and your story. Tell your story. Hey guys. Thanks for sticking with us. We're back this week with a brand new episode and a brand new name too. We are, have now gone officially from Gals with Gumption to She's Got Gumption. And on this week's episode, you'll get to hear my conversation with Carrie Poffenberger. She uh, was somebody that I met when I lived in a very small town halfway between Austin and Houston. And she's one of those people that once you know her, you just, you got to know more. She's amazing. Um, she's wonderful. This is easily one of my favorite uh, interviews and conversations. Um, I'm going to warn you guys though, grab the tissues because it is literally that good. Here's my conversation with I know a little bit Carrie. about your background, your story, but I'm really excited for you to be able to share it, you know, with everyone else. And I mean, this is like the first time I'm going to hear everything too. So no pressure or anything. I know. <laughs> well, Lord help me not leave out anything super important, but, um, so I think that where my story begins was is at a um, in a very chaotic household growing up. My dad was a drug addict and a alcoholic, and I don't remember not being ashamed mm-hmm. of who I was, and it was because my identity was wrapped up in how my parents were acting and all that dysfunction. And I didn't know that was normal at the time, but I just knew how it made me feel. And so I had an overwhelming sense of shame most of my life about the decisions that my parents made. Hmm. And, um, but I always remember this presence of God um, throughout my whole life. He would meet with me in my closet as a little girl. I would kind of go in there to escape. And I just, I knew he was my maker. I knew he was God. Um, and when the first time I ever heard about Jesus, I, I knew that he was God's son. Um, but things really shifted for me when I was about 11 years old. I went to a church camp and um, met the Lord, knew I was a sinner, and um, totally repentive, just fell in love with the Lord. I knew that that was what was missing in my my life. And um, so I went to bed that night, and like always, I was scared to death of going to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that was just something that I always had in childhood. And I was scared to put to be by this window that bordered the top bunk. But anyway, somehow I finally found fell asleep. And the first night I got saved, I had my first dream. Hmm. And the reason I'm sharing it is it's so significant for how the Lord walked me out of um, extreme, difficult suffering. Um And my dream was that the devil himself came and snatched me by the feet and pulled me through that window. I was on the top bunk and he got me out of the dorm and stood me up and turned me around and I was facing him and all of a sudden Jesus shows up with a sword. And they begin this epic sword fight and I'm talking it looked like Princess Bride you know where you know they're going at it and um, all of a sudden I look up and I'm staring at Jesus and he is um, just deflecting the the attack of the enemy on him without even looking he's Mm -hmm. he's, his gaze was on me and he was watching me and I realized he was waiting on me to understand something And I just said, wait a second, you've already won. And Mm -hmm. boom, he cut that devil's head off. And it is a dream that has never left me. 
it has come back to visit throughout. And so um, I had some, I was a wild child. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't all roses after I got saved, but um, very early on, um, I really just felt like I needed to humble myself before the Lord at about 19 years old and, um, and just listen to what his, his leading was because mine was kind of making a mess. Mm -hmm. My will was not going very well. So, um, I had another encounter there with him and laid a whole lot of things down and was really willing to follow him at that point. And, um, I went home and I got married to my high school sweetheart and, um, we had dated previously. The Lord completely reconciled us. And um, he was just such a picture of God's unconditional love for me. He knew everything about me, all my screw-ups, all my hang-ups, and he loved me anyway. And um, it was just a pretty picture of how God could look past all our gunk and my husband still does that, you know. He's just amazing in that way. But we got married, and um, I got a maid. I married a, an amazing man. And the first year of marriage, I was like, "What did I do?" <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know anything about healing. I didn't know anything in uh, about triggers. And I um, basically my childhood came back to haunt me. Um, everything that I learned about men and, and husbands through my dad, I began to treat my husband like he was doing that kind of thing, and right. he wasn't. And so I found myself on the couch of a Christian counselor, and um, it radically changed my life because I went from knowing the Lord seeking him and following him but then experiencing him and healing was a whole nother realm of relationship right um so i i she said tell me about your relationship with your dad and i just broke and um i went back to a memory actually of where my dad had come home but he was living with another woman and I was mad at him for, you know, being in two households. Yeah. And I told him, I said, you need to leave. And I'm probably a seven-year-old kid. Wow. And um, I'm sitting there cross-legged in the living room and telling a, a grown man to leave his house. And he did. He left. And um, the lie that I picked up there was I'm not worth very much. I'm not worth him staying for. And um, my Christian counselor said, well, what do you think Jesus wants you to know? And in that moment, the God of the universe, and I just knew it was him. I was fully in my pain, and the God of the universe sat down beside me and put his arm around me. And it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. It, at the core of who I was, um, I knew that I wasn't ever alone. I wasn't rejected by him. And it really freed up a spot in the core of who I was to um, lean in hard and trust in Jesus. So I had lots of healing moments like that, but that was the the initial big foundation of God can heal you like that. Yeah. He can touch my pain and he can reach into a place where no human word would have helped. Mm -hmm. um, it's pivotal so in your life. It was, it was. And so um, out of that encounter, not too long after that, I was, um, I found out that I was pregnant and I began to hear God's voice really clearly. For instance, um, I knew I was pregnant, 
before I even took the pregnancy test. I knew it was a little boy. Um, the Lord had led me to Hannah, um, and I just knew that I needed to dedicate my son to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So um, I was on a mountaintop in Colorado. It was in a moment where I don't know if you're familiar with Young Life, but all Young Life camps in the middle of the week, they send out the whole camp and to be quiet and to ask God to reveal himself to them for the first time maybe ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was during that moment that I dedicated my son to the Lord, and I truly gave him fully. And um, I just had this this desire, this burning desire to attach that little boy to the Lord because I was I was finding so much wholeness in in my pursuit of Jesus mm-hmm. that I wanted him to be born with that. Right. And so I would speak to his spirit. And I knew that maybe his little brain wouldn't get in it, but I just forged this connection of just, hey, JJ, this is who God is. And I would talk to him all the time. And I didn't know. Now looking back, I was like, I was preaching to myself, yeah. you know. Right. <laughs> Too. But I, I would pray scriptures and um, we would just, I would talk to my unborn child about who God was. And um, when he was born, uh, he was about three months old when I had to come to the terms that he was turning blue and he might be having little seizures. Um, I'd begun to see it about six weeks old, but um, you kind of tell yourself it's maybe breath holding or maybe that's just kind of a dusky look on their lips you know um and then all of a sudden my mom saw it one day when I was at her house and she said I think he's having a little seizure and I said shut up don't say that yeah and she said honey you need to go get him checked out and at that point he wasn't tracking uh he wasn't really holding his head well, and um, we took him to the seat, the doctor, and he was actually having hundreds of seizures. Wow. And that um, began a terrifying, probably 30-day hospital stay. We were in and out a couple of times, but we would have to just go right back, of um, him having really bad seizures and did they have a name for any of this or no Mm. no it it was it's called idiopathic when they cannot find why they're having those seizures Mm. and his were very resistant to medicine so he was in the hospital and I was all alone because my husband owns his own business with his brother and he would be there as much as he could, but he'd have to go back and check on things. And I remember a doctor walked in while I was all alone, and he said, Look, your little boy can't see. We can't tell if he's ever going to know anything. He might be deaf. He might be blind. He might be retarded. Wow. And... and I don't, this is a lot of seizures for a little baby to be having. Right. And in that moment, obviously, because the Lord had done a work in me over that year of being, getting my own healing, I just said, Lord, I don't have the ability to change any of this. Like, this is, this has got to be you. And I believe you can heal him. Yeah. Um, I need you. And I began to ask the Lord to heal my son. And um, as I did that, faith rose up in me. And I knew it was going to happen. So uh, kind of fast forward of a very long journey, a very painful um, 
disease we that we never we we didn't know if it was cerebral palsy or brain injury or an actual disease that he had we just had no answers all we could do was treat the symptoms yeah and um we got to a place where he was always pretty unstable medically but we got to a place where we could take care of him at home and we would we tried to go back to normal life as much as possible which meant me staying at home with him and us seeking the lord together so he turned into my little prayer partner mm-hmm. um, and it was a little boy that couldn't really control his eyes but if you would start to talk about Jesus he would turn his head to you and try to make eye contact Aww. and his he his smile would come out and he would just have all kinds of things to say and it was really remarkable and visible when you talked about the Lord that little boy lit up he knew him yeah. and so that always gave me a whole lot of peace but I would have dreams and um, and just get confirmation that the Lord was with him he wasn't leaving or forsaking him and um, and that his healing would come so I held on to that and got pregnant again um, we neither one of us had any family history of any genetic disorder and my daughter Lily was born in 2008 so JJ was three years old when she was born and um, she right away I knew when she came out she was the exact same size as JJ was when he was born she was real small um, same features I mean they look like they could have been identical twins and uh, the same movements and so my sweet Lily um, very early on wound up in the hospital as well and was Um, it six weeks again uh, really close to that yeah when she started having infantile spasms which was a little bit of a different form of seizure than what JJ presented with, but it was just as frequent, and um, they can they can take kids out fast. Um, so she, by six months, was not able to even really cry. She was very thin, and I thought that my both my kids were dying at that point, and. Um, I had been doing a study um, about Israel, and I just was really into Hebrew roots. Mm-hmm. And by the time I'm in the hospital watching number kid number two die, the other one is at home with fever and just um, really hard to care for as well. And I'm stuck in the hospital with my daughter wondering, what have I done? I brought another child into this world yeah. with this horrible disease and um, I just asked God I said what are you have you just left us I mean what is going on yeah and uh, I went and got a coffee at Starbucks across the street from Texas Children's and I walked back across um, the street and I went up to my daughter's room and I had never seen a Jewish doctor before, but lo and behold, I walk in the room and there's this Jewish doctor with a little kippah on his head standing over my daughter. And um, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I have not forgotten my people Mm -hmm. and I will not forget you. And it was just one of those other confirming moments that... um, I'm going to walk this out with you. Yeah. So God was so present and so real throughout this whole ordeal. Um, from sending people to knock on my door to pray for my kids that day to um, prophetic words, all kinds of things that 
we really needed. Like they were manna for the time and season that we were in because these were two very, very sick children. Yeah. And um, so anyway, she, I, I take Lily home and um, I had them home probably another two months together. And at that point, probably eight hours of my day was feeding those two kids because when they have neurological problems, you know, you can, it's like feeding a baby that's actually too small to, to spoon feed. Right. It's like a quarter of the spoonful stayed in their mouth and then the rest gets put, pushed yeah. out, you know? Yeah. So, um, I would breastfeed Lily and then I'd be spoon feeding JJ and and when you have neurologic, neurological issues, you don't sleep a lot of times. It can yeah. really disrupt sleep. So at that point, JJ wasn't sleeping. And he would cry for hours and hours. And I was just fried. I was emotionally, physically, spiritually. I was clinging to the Lord, but I was ride and I went to Anna's house to go talk to her about something I forgot what I was gonna see see her about but somehow I wound up in her house for about 20 minutes and she asked me how am I doing and I went through my my good the Lord's been faithful type talk with her and she looked at me and she said well you know it would be okay if you weren't okay right and I said I know I know and she goes no really she said anybody in your shoes would have some sort of anger or some sort of something they needed to work out with the Lord and I said maybe there is some little part of me that does need to go get real with yeah. him and she said she said I think he's big enough to handle whatever you have in your heart and it's not hidden from him anyway yeah and I was like okay <laughs> so because of how real and how present the Lord had been over the years with these kids I really thought that um, when I had my confrontation with the Lord, that I might get struck by lightning. Like, this might not go well, and I might end up dead after this. Um, so I went to the park across from my, sh my house, and I stood there. And I lifted my hands up to the Lord, and I shook my fist at him. And I said, if this is your way of making me a better person... I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting lightning. <laughs> and again, the presence of the Lord just fell. And I could literally feel the Lord's embrace. And he said, of course, that's not all I'm doing. Yeah. And I, I just, I, that moment kind of just revealed God's character in a way that I still am just undone. Obviously, it makes me cry just even mm. thinking about it. But Gives me chills. It was a beautiful, beautiful, loving way he just showed up. And, uh. Again, you know, I went in and I mustered what little strength that I had left um, to care for my kids, but it was what I needed to keep going. Yeah. And um, so my, my son grew into where you couldn't really put him down. He was unconsolable. Mm -hmm. He was probably on seven medicines at that point. Was he in a lot of pain? 
Well, it's it was a pain-like cry, mm. but there are certain neurological conditions where your your brain is telling you that you're uncomfortable and you're right. and it may not necessarily be a physical ailment. So that's that's what they thought that it was, yeah. but there was it was just miserable and he was miserable. But the only thing that would calm him down was I would I would Joni Erickson Tata had a CD out that was called Passion Hymns for Christian Hearts or something like that. And it was these kids singing these old hymns. And that would calm JJ down to where I could lay him down or something. Wow. Listen to it. And then the other thing that I could do was play the Bible on CDs. So I bought this huge six six CD changer and um, just had them on rotate. So um, I laid JJ and Lily side by side and I went in the kitchen one day and those hymns were on and for kids that they told me didn't know anything about their surroundings, they um, had turned themselves towards each other so they could, they couldn't roll really, Mm -hmm. couldn't do anything that was a purposeful movement in the doctor's eyes. But then I would see things like we're going to roll towards each other and and look at each other, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's what they had done, and they had reached out and somehow found each other's hands. Oh. And um, I was standing in the kitchen, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, look up. And so I did. And I saw him talking to Lily, and he was kind of holding her hand. And then all of a sudden, he rolled over to see somebody who had just walked in the room and looked over his shoulder. And as he did that, um, Song of Solomon had come on the CD player after that, the hymns I had been playing. Mm -hmm. And all I could hear was, you are beautiful to me. Come away with me. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eye. Come away with me. I think it's Solomon 4. I could be wrong. But um, that's the moment I looked up and watched this event. And I knew I had seen something, and I knew the Lord told me to watch it. But I couldn't really understand what I was seeing. Mm. And um, I put JJ in his bed that night. And I I don't remember. Lily, I think, at that point was sleeping okay. But um, somehow he went to sleep for a few hours because I, I was able to go to sleep and I had a baby monitor. And I heard him start to have a seizure that night. And I turned the baby monitor off so it wouldn't wake my husband up. And... I was going to go in there like I was getting out of bed and somehow I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And um, when I woke up the next morning, he was, I I went in there and I rolled him over and he was stiff Mm -hmm. and I knew he was gone. And I felt something, my breath, I lost my breath. I was in complete shock. Yeah. And then I felt something touch me on my shoulder, and I fell back in gas. And um, and then I was able to crawl into the living room and call nine one one. But he was already stiff. I knew he was gone. Yeah. It was just what you do. So. Um, My husband and I prayed for him and asked the Lord if we should pray that he be resurrected and come back to his body. And the Lord was like, no. Mm -hmm. 
and we knew. We knew he was free. We knew he was um, in heaven, mm -hmm. and that it was the Lord's way of ultimately healing him. Absolutely. And um, it just changed our perspective, and it ended up changing our life in, in a, an amazing way. Um, I can get into that a little bit later, but what happened was later on that night, I laid in JJ's bed, and if you can imagine a grieving mom, I just mm -hmm. rolled around and just cried. I was bawling, and I needed to hear from the Lord. Yeah. And then the Lord just, it was like he opened up my vision and put me back in those moments of the day. So the day before when I was watching him, and I watched him roll over and look behind him about, behind him, it was the Lord and two angels standing there in my living room calling JJ home. Yeah. And he knew. And all I could remember was the smile on JJ's face when he got that call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I also kind of got back into the the uh, the part of the day where I found him and I rolled over and I felt that touch on my shoulder and the Lord said, that was JJ waiting for you. Mm. And he said, he gave you back everything you needed that you had given him, you're going to need for life. Yeah. He didn't want to take it part of your heart to heaven with him. You're going to need it. Yeah. And so... Excuse me, sorry. You're fine. Um, and so it was like this foundational piece to, I don't, I, I hate to say, but even walking out this grief that you have as a mother and losing kids and watching them suffer was realizing the importance of wholeness in people's I don't think anybody needs part of them living in heaven when they still are needed here. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't, it, it didn't separate me from my son, you know, in a, in, in the, any more than I'm already separated from him. I will see him again and I have that hope. But I didn't need my heart torn. And um, I was so close to that child because when when you can't physically communicate you attach to your kids in a different way as a caregiver right it's, it's a very deep bond and it's um very spiritual mm. and so to have that part of me back i um i really feel like it delivered me from the fear of losing Lily in the same way um, because my greatest fear was realized at that point and I was living through it right and I knew that if the Lord was gonna walk me walk with me through that I'm not gonna fear the future I'm just gonna take one day at a time and if Lily goes home to be with the Lord too I'm going to see her again, too. Right. And so Lily was so much sicker than JJ when she was a baby. And to the Lord's delight and to my delight, she was um, just as able to attach to God as JJ was. Um, and she ended up living until this past year, um, and she was nine years old. So, um, we took Lily in for a surgery, and 
she was getting a baclofen pump because at that point um, she was really, really suffering with dystonia. Okay. Um, it appeared like a grand mal seizure, but she could feel the whole thing and she could remember the whole thing. And with a grand mal seizure, you wouldn't. Hmm. Yeah. So it, it caused a lot of shaking. She would shake for hours and um, it was just really painful. And so we were um, doing the surgery for comfort. And we had found out that they had, they finally put, um, re-ran a genetic testing sample that we had done and found that they tested positive for a disease caused, called galloway Moat disease, which affects you neurologically and your kidney function. So, um... We, we didn't have much to go on because we knew that JJ passed away with a seizure. Yeah. But um, Lily, because she was nine and so much more advanced than JJ, her kidneys were starting to, her renal function was um, affected and she had all this stuff. So we were trying to comfort her and get her a back open pump. Well, we had... We had signed a DNR for her when her kidneys started to lose function because we knew that that was kind of a sign that her body was tired. Yeah. And um, somehow, after the surgery, she got sepsis. Mm -hmm. And... Um, We had to make the hard decision to either make her fight it or let her go. And I don't wish this on anybody um, because it felt like we had a choice. That, and so we made the choice to let her, let her go. And I'll tell you why. Because... I, I had another vision, and for me, the, the Lord speaks to me very visually a lot of times. And um, I saw Lily, and her back was turned to me, and she was standing at the base of this mountain. And the temple of God was at the top. And I knew that that's where she desired to go. Mm -hmm. And... As the doctors, she was in intensive care, and they said, they began to explain to us all the things that she would have to go through, and they couldn't promise that they would even work, but what she would have to endure in order to survive this. And um, I saw this whole mountain range that she was going to have to walk as they were talking. And... Um, then I saw her when I saw her standing at the base of this this mountain with the temple of God at the top. And so I knew what her choice was. Yeah. So my husband was getting the same thing. Um, he knew she was tired and she had fought a long time. So we had to make the choice to not have her fight it um so we kept her you know fed and just waited to see what her body would do and she passed away very very fast probably within 12 hours um and it was beautiful as well i don't know if you've ever seen anybody pass away but They leave. Yeah. And there's a part of there's a part of everybody. And this is what my kids taught me too. There's what makes you really you is your spirit. Right. And it's eternal. When you've watched somebody pass away, you know that that part of them just left their body. Yeah, it's gone. And there's no there's no putting that to death. 
Mm. It's it's eternal, and I don't know how to describe watching it, but I watched my daughter launch out of her body, and then her heart flatline. Um, it was the most beautiful moment. Um, and I'm thankful that the Lord just let me be aware in both instances that that he was with them and present and had it taken care of. And, and, a, and we had a lot of peace and a lot of joy that day, but um, the months that followed that were the hardest of my life. Mm. Um, medical science gave Lily nine years yeah. with, with partnering with the Lord. I mean, obviously it was in his will, but um, medicine, he used medicine to keep her alive. But there's this ethical dilemma that we think we have these choices, right? Mm -hmm. That we, you know, from, the, from prehistory on, people knew life and death is in God's hands. Right. And, and we believe that. But when you're in a hospital with, with choices to make, it puts you in a position that only God was really supposed to stand in, right. really. And so the months that followed were the darkest of my life, I have to say. Not only was that part of me that was a caregiver for 12 years, because this disease, you know, was my life for 12 years. Yeah. Um, So I went from not, not being a caregiver anymore, but more importantly, I just could not stop thinking about what was it the right decision. Mm -hmm. Because you were given the choice? Because we had to tell the doctors what to do. Right. You know, honestly, I don't know if she would have survived either way. But because we were put in the position of needing to... Um, it was just so insanely difficult. So, um, that rolled around in my head. You know how something makes you sick? Yeah. The thought of something can make you sick. Absolutely. So that was happening to me every day for a good three months. And, um, I was talking to a good friend on the phone and I just said, I really just need be with the Lord. And she said, yeah, like you need to lay down and not get up until he's talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, like one of those moments. And um, I went home and I laid down on my carpet. And I said, Lord, I can't keep living like this. I have to be able to let this go. And I have never been one to think that people need to talk to the dead, that need to seek out anything like that. But yeah. this, I think, was God's sovereign sovereignty. I knew I was at the feet of the Lord. And JJ and Lily, I knew, were just standing there. And um, Lily just started talking to me, and she said, mm -hmm. Mom, Mom, I'm free. Yeah. I am free. Look. And she started jumping and dancing. And JJ was standing right beside her. And he didn't say anything. He just looked at me. And Lily just made sure I knew. She, I am free. And, man, I didn't know I was going to cry this much when you. <laughs> But it it released me because I really knew it was her. And I was so thankful for the Lord. And uh, before I got up, I heard JJ say, and Mom, we're praying for Lady and Dad too. Aww. And 
And then I got up. And I didn't introduce Lady. She is our third child that we had. Uh, we adopted. And um, because we had the two kids with a genetic disorder, yeah. um, we decided adoption was the next way to expand our family. And um, the Lord totally orchestrated this amazing scenario where we met a girl well I take that back I was in a Bible study with a lady for years she became a really good friend and um, she had adopted four kids and one of her daughters ended up running off to Austin and got married to a guy that beat her up and threw her on the street and she, for whatever reasons, was living that lifestyle and um, choosing it. But she ended up getting pregnant. And my friend said, will you go and see my daughter for her birthday with me? I really need to talk to her about her not keeping this baby because she doesn't have anything to keep her. And I said, sure, because mm -hmm. at that point, we knew adoption was on our radar, but the Lord would, wouldn't really open up a way to kind of pursue it. Right. I just, you know, was waiting. And um, I was even walking down the street one day, and my neighbor stopped me, and he said, Have you all thought about adopting? And I said, Yes. <laughs> and he said, Well, good. I was thinking that for you all the other day. And he said, I think somebody's going to bring you all a baby. And when they do, I want to be your lawyer, and I want to help you. Wow. Said, Hello, okay. gift from heaven right there. Do you know how much lawyers cost? Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, we paid him some, but he definitely was discounted. But. Yeah. Wow. So I go to this meeting with this young mom, and she gets in the car. I first meet her, and she's totally bubbly, loves this baby, talks to this baby and lays her hands on her tummy and says, I am naming this, this my baby girl Destiny Lynn because she's going to have a good destiny. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in the front seat going, I don't know this girl. You have certain things that you think about people who live on the street, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. the most godly people have <laughs> these different ideas of people that live on the street but right. I instantly fell in love with this girl and the way that she was loving this child and um, her boyfriend was with her who was not the dad and we go to eat anyway, we are sitting across from each other at the table and we start talking about what is she going to do with her baby and she looked at her mom and she started crying and saying, I love my baby very much. But she said, every time I pray about it, mom, I feel like I'm carrying somebody else's blessing. Mm. And she looked at the across the table, looked me in the eye and said, I think it might be you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I was bawling at that point. And, um... And then I got to open up and share with her what was going on in our life and that we actually were considering adopting. And so um, from that moment, we I called my husband, um, who is, he's a skeptic, you know? Mm -hmm. He's just yeah. a natural skeptic, but he knew that um, this was the dilemma that a pregnant woman was living on the streets of Austin. She had a huge basketball and regardless of the outcome, even if we weren't going to end up with this baby, that it was something that we could do to offer help. And so, um, we put her in a hotel room and, um, just helped her get to the doctor with, with, conversations about us adopting her her baby 
but for us, we knew enough about people changing their minds and stuff like that, that the Lord had us kind of very hold loosely. So on October 5th, 2010, a beautiful little baby girl was born. Mm. And we got to be there. And um, Is she like, you're talking about me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the grace of God, this mom had the strength to let us take her home and um, and walk out this adoption process with us. Wow. And it was the biggest gift besides my salvation that I had ever received. Um, the whole journey with attaching to this new baby and, and all that adoption teaches you about the Lord himself is just an amazing thing and a whole nother phone call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Lord just gave us a gift. I mean, just gave us a gift. And the whole time, you know, it was, let me give you this gift. And the guy that, in the state of Texas, if you're married, and remember I said she got married and he beat her up? Mm-hmm. If you're married, he's presumed the father. Right. So you have to deal with him. And uh, he was trying to get her. He mm-hmm. fought us. And even though she wasn't his baby, he tried to fight us. And I was ready to mortgage my house and fight this guy. Like, get a PI, prove all this stuff about him. And the Lord said, let me give you a gift. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ugh. So just the same as I couldn't have motives with um, with mom and just had to let her do what she really in her heart wanted to do, I had to, to turn loose of the, the fight. Um, and so the, the guy even showed up to the adoption hearing and asked for custody and... Um, the Lord handled it beautifully. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, he, the judge said, you're not the dad. It'd be totally inappropriate for you to have anything to do with this hearing at all. Mm. And he asked him to like sit down and shut up. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and it was like, all right, Lord, I didn't have to do anything. Right. And, um, I just received this beautiful gift. And so... Um, Lainey had some health issues herself, but she is dramatically healthier. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that she has any. She couldn't talk for a while when she was little. She was a late talker. And um, we took her to get her hearing tested, and she failed twice. So when you fail, she failed her newborn screen, but that's normal. And then when she didn't start talking, we took her back. She failed again. So that was at about two years old. And um, when you fail twice, they give you what they call a sedated ADR, where they hook your, hook you up to the same kind of sound machine, and they do different frequencies. And they you're asleep, and they watch your brain respond to these sounds. So they can tell exactly what you're hearing at what pitches. Hmm. So it was determined that she had moderate hearing loss in her left ear. So we got her all this testing done. We were going to the hearing aid appointment to get fitted for the hearing aid. And the lady said, my my probe was a little twisted in her ear during the sedated ADR. I recalibrated everything. She's still going to need a hearing aid, but let me just test her one more time. And of course we had prayed for healing for her ear. Um, So when we sat down, she tested higher in the bad ear than the the good ear. Mm -hmm. She completely passed with perfect hearing. And um, she was like, I can't explain that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can. We prayed. 
<laughs> you know? And she goes, well, maybe my machine was messed up more than I thought. I said, ma'am, this child failed the hearing test three times on yeah. three different machines. I was like, it wasn't just your probe being twisted. And um, she said, well, come back in three months. And let's see if it, like, comes and goes, maybe. And we came back in three months, and it's fine. But after she, her hearing was healed, she started talking. Um, she had a speech delay. Uh, she had speech apraxia, which mm-hmm. um, she knows what she wants to say, but it it won't come out. Yeah. So that's taken a while to, you know, push past. But um, I really think the whole hearing thing is really cool you know, to be a part of your story. Absolutely. Well, oh, and I think it? about when God kept telling you, let me give you a gift, let me give you a gift. Like, not only was the gift Lainey, but the there was healing in Lainey. You guys had prayed over JJ, you'd prayed over Lily for healing, and here's Lainey, the gift to you, and then you pray for healing, and it happens. And it's right. like, now you've get, he's given you a gift again. Yeah, I mean, he he would do certain things with JJ and Lily, too, where they would need a healing, and he'd give, like, this partial healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, one morning, Lily woke up, and half of her face was drooping down, This, you know, like she had had a stroke or something. Mm. And it was right after JJ passed away. Um, and... I mean, her eye was drooped down, her mouth was completely drooped down in the corner, and I took her to the meat market where my husband works, and I was so exhausted, I'm embarrassed that I said this, but I needed coffee, and I was trying to muster the strength up to take her to the ER, which this doesn't sound right, because you you think that happens and you need to call 911, but this is literally what happened. He goes what's wrong with Lily? And I said, I'm really trying to muster the strength to go back into the hospital. And he reached over and touched her on the side of her head and said, Lord Jesus, that's all he said. But I saw the healing come out of his hand and her face snapped up like that. And so thank you, Lord, for not sending me that day to the hospital. Right. Um, so we That's witnessed, a gift in and of itself. Yes. I mean, I, at that point, I was just so done. And, and grief has that way of just completely draining you, mm. you know, completely draining you. Um, and so we would have things, you know, periodically that would happen like that. So we knew he was listening. We knew he responded when we cried out. Um, it was just that his will was... You know, I'm going to take them home fully. Yeah. And and there's something to be said. You know, we, we think kind of worst case scenario is to be handicapped physically. Mm-hmm. But when I got to witness two, two of my children that lacked nothing in the spirit, they didn't have a day where they had depression. Right. And didn't know God, you know, and yeah. and out, you know, and so the it was that part of it was just beautiful because though their outer man was perishing, their spirit flourished, and it was just apparent. And the Lord let us watch that, and that's really what He's concerned with. Yeah, in case we've all got this messed up, <laughs> you know, we need physical healing. But when we don't get it, there's something available to our spirit that's going to get us through. And that's grace. Mm -hmm. There is always grace available. You have to reach up and get it sometimes. Right. But there is always those moments with the Lord. And I'm talking, you know, I talked about a, a lot of different little moments that to somebody they were little, but to me they got me through. Right. You know, and so um, anyway, it, it's profound to, to see that. And so, you know, who we are in the spirit is a big deal. 
God really cares about our eternal, our eternal um, condition. Mm -hmm. He's not. He's not always worried about this momentary thing, and and it's not that he doesn't care, but he's always doing something, you know. Right. Oh yeah. And so I think sometimes we have to come back to that, and and cling to what we know and cling to hope because he's up to something always. It's beautiful and it's brave and it's inspiring and I'm like sitting here getting chills like just listening to everything that you're saying and I just I wanted to ask you um, when we met a few years back you had said that God told you to write a book have you written uh, a book <laughs> I know I'm that you have written some back. because I've stalked you online yeah um so I've sat down many times and um, like just talking about it today, you know, the emotions flow. So it's, mm. it's not something that I have been able to sit down and write 45 minutes and then come back to it another day and write another 45 minutes. What the Lord did was really beautiful. And every time I look at it, I, I weep. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's very emotional for it's me heavy. to go back to those yeah those mm -hmm. those monuments with the Lord, you know, like at the park and you know at the hospitals and there's just so many of them. I got to touch on a few, but there's just so many of them. But it's just emotionally so intense that I really need to just stop life and be able to do it, and I haven't figured that out. <laughs> well, I would encourage you to just keep going back to it, and even if it takes, like, just five minutes, because you've got such a great story, and people need to hear it because you've come th through troubles when you were younger. You had troubles in the middle. I mean, you're not all, like tied up and pretty and neat and everything's perfect now none of nope. us are but I think through that women would find healing and the more that you speak to those things the more um it takes away the power of the the shame and the guilt and everything that just kind of weighs us down like the more you speak about it the more you talk about it I think it really takes its power away and I, there's so many women out there that are just crippled by maybe not just grief, but so much other junk that if we don't right. give words to it, they can't find that healing that's already there for them. They can't reach out for that grace or that freedom that is already there. And there's plenty of it. And like you said, we just have to reach for it. Um, but, but they can't even muster up the strength to reach, if that makes sense. Right. I'm a, I'm a words person, you know, um, I've, there was dark parts of this journey that the only people that I felt got what I was going through were, you know, like Oswald Chambers and C.S. Lewis and, <laughs> you know, these, these mighty men of words but also that, talk about a hard read right there. <laughs> yeah, but it, but I would grasp mm. those, you know, those concepts that they were able to to talk about and and talk about him him being the Lord. Mm. You know, and all of his majesty and all of his wonder and all of his character just him and it was those words that would point me back to who he really is because in if you're in your circumstances your circumstances lie mm -hmm. your emotions lie they will try to get you to walk by what you see and there were so many times along the way that I had to raise my hand and say out loud I will not go off of how I feel I will not go off of what I see in the natural. I'm going to cling to Jesus. And I would yell this stuff through my house, you mm -hmm. know. Um, 
And I and though you slay me, Lord, I will trust you. I'm going to trust you. And really, in reality, that was the only option for me because life was so out of control. The sickness was so intense that there was there wasn't anything a doctor could do. There wasn't any book I could read and get smart enough and you know do you enough fix it. oils. Yeah. yeah, no. There was no fixing it. And so um, anyway, it definitely I, I'm a words person and I I get every, the Lord just keeps bugging me about it. You know, I almost feel disobedient for not sitting and writing more often because I do do it. Um, but I do need to keep going down that road. <laughs> so before we got on the call, I told you that I wanted to ask you what you're reading right now. And you said you're reading a good book. So I want to hear what you're reading, what you're getting out of it. Oh man. I'm reading Heinz feet. Have you ever that? read it? No. Oh, so it's this allegory of this woman whose name is Much Afraid. And she is in love with the shepherd that lives in her valley that she communicates with and just has this awesome relationship with. And he's the only light in her little valley that she lives in. Um, she, her last name is Fearling or Fearing, something like that. And... Um, She's just much afraid of everything. And it's this journey that the shepherd takes her to the high places. And it's all allegorical, but um, the things that she has to walk through, um, she goes through a desert and a wasteland and by the sea. And when it looks like she's never going to reach the high places, um the shepherd will show up and give her just that grace that she needs to keep going and saying, you know, will you trust me? Mm -hmm. Because when you get to the high places, I'm going to give you a new name and I'm going to transform you into a beautiful being. And, you know, all these promises that he gave her that he would have to show up and remind her because there was plenty of things to kind of come come between her and her getting to the high places but once you're up at the high places you get hind's feet and part of why you go through what you go through through all the different terrains is so that your hind's feet can develop mm. it's beautiful and her companions and her guides for the trip are sorrow and suffering Wow. And at first she was so fearful of them and then she embraced them, you know, because she learned that they were just leading her to him. You know, I mean, wow. the whole thing is good. So if you, have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? No. Like, listen to it. It's, that one's a hard read because it's old English. Oh, yeah. But High was written in the 70s and it's, it's so readable, but I, I encourage any believer that has had any suffering in their life to read this book because it is such a amazing picture of a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an it's an older book. It's famous. Um, if you look it up, you'll find it. But I am loving it. Um, towards the end, it's beautiful. It makes you fall in love with Jesus. I love that. That's awesome. What is the the quote or the motto or the song or the Bible verse that just carries you through every day? Like your life's motto? Well, I say, I think, I don't even know where this psalm is because it's, it's one that's reoccurring within the psalms. But those who trust in the Lord will not be put to shame. Mm. Is That always stands out to me. Um but I would say, I don't really have a motto, but I talk about this all the time because people go, oh, you're so strong, like I can't believe, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I can't take credit for any of it. And I have started telling people, if I have any strength, it was in laying down. Yeah. 
I would lay there and wait on the Lord mm. to show up. The and strength is in the surrender. The strength is in the surrender, if you want to put pretty words to it. But, I mean, <laughs> that is, that is, I know my limits, and I, I have a whole bunch of them. Mm. And when I hit them, I lay down, and I, I wait. And so if, if I have any strength, <laughs> that's what it's from. And uh, I'm just so thankful because the Lord does show up. And he does give you what you need for the day. And you can, you know, I look back and, and I, I know that he deposited so much along the way in me so that I could give to others. And I say that humbly. Like, I don't say, oh, the world needs me, you right. know. But I know I have something to give. And it's because it came straight from him, yeah. you know. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how I live, what I live by. I love it. Thank you so much, Carrie, for doing this with me and sharing your story and just being brave enough. I mean, you are strong, but like you said, that, that comes from the Lord for sure. But you're, you're brave in that your willingness to talk about it, even though you know it'll make you cry it'll make you have all the feelings and everything again and some people just shove that down and just try to pretend like it's not there but but you don't do that so that's what makes you brave to me oh thank you um one of another moment i just had with the lord was lord please don't let this pain be in vain Mm. And I share when everybody, when anybody asks me to share, I try to say yes because it makes my pain not be in vain. Yeah. It's an opportunity the Lord has, has opened. So I hope, I'm praying that if anybody listens to this and gets something out of it, that it blesses you in some way. I told you guys that was a good one. And I don't usually lie about those things. Some of my favorite things that um, Carrie said, I even posted on in the, my Instagram is, there is always grace available. And isn't that just the way? And we just don't fully understand that. And then um, one that just I've been repeating myself uh, here lately is, and though you slay me, Lord, I will trust you. It's just in those broken places, in those dark places, it's so hard to remember that and to say that over and over again. And I think Carrie is somebody that has earned the right to say that and that um, has come through, you know, only by the grace of God, but but with flying colors. Um, and then her her favorite Bible verse, those who trust in the Lord will not be put to shame. I think that's something that is very hard to choose every day and to look and to say, yes, I will always trust you, Lord. Um, especially in, in those really dark, dark times and dark seasons when it seems like everything's going wrong and the world is against you. Um, you can always remember that Jesus already overcame the world. So thank you guys for joining us and thanks for sticking with us. Episode 10 is next week. I'm so excited. It'll be a continuation of my story. Um, I'll actually be sharing some excerpts from my book that I wrote. What? Yes, I wrote a book. Um, It is not out or available for anyone else to read because apparently I'm not very good at the English language and we're working on some edits for it. Um, But stay tuned for that because I will have some giveaways and stuff on my website. That's wendyjolson.com. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. My username is at Mrs. MRS Wendy J. Olson. Um, If you miss me during the week, because I miss you guys too. So come in and check on me. Thanks again, guys, for listening to She's Got Gumption.